there are people in this room right now who if they die will be translated into heaven and they will bear upon themselves a glory unspeakable and there are other people in this room right now who if they die will be sent by the judgment of God straight into hell where the grace of God is totally removed and they will be revealed as the monsters that they truly are you see those of us who preach the gospel we are not here to entertain you we are not here to talk to you about temporal things about how you can get the best that you can get out of this present life no I am not concerned tonight about your self-esteem I am not concerned about whether or not your billfold and your checkbook balance themselves out I'm concerned about one thing one day each and every one of you will stand naked before a holy God and you will be judged that is my great concern this is not a game this is not something that has to do with culture Western or Eastern this has to do with the Word of the Living God the gospel of Jesus Christ life and death heaven and hell and it is an amazing burden for a preacher to stand before a group of people knowing that some of you will hear my voice and go to heaven when you die and others of you will hear warning after warning after warning and you will not listen and you will die under the wrath of God and spend eternity in hell that is why it is such a difficult thing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ now before I take my text I want to say one other thing I am particularly burdened for the young people who are here many of you who are older you know what it's like to follow Christ you know what it's like to pay dearly for your faith you know what it's like to suffer. You would rather die than deny Jesus Christ or live in a way that contradicts His Word. But young people, listen to me. Many of you were raised here. Many of you were born in the West. And you need to be very, very careful. This Christianity is not a cultural thing. This Christianity is, is not something that just should be a small part of your life. It is not something that you do on Sunday. Christianity is not about you living in the world six days a week and coming to church. Christianity is not about you being just like the world all the time and then coming to church on Sunday. If that is your Christianity, you have no Christianity. You are not Christian. It is a dangerous thing to be raised in a Christian family. It is a dangerous thing to be raised in a Christian community because you may think that somehow because your parents are Christian, you are Christian. Or because you come from a group of people who have suffered that you too participate in that glory. That is not true. Young people, let me ask you a question. How do you know that you're Christian how do you know that you have truly come to know Christ how do you know that if you died right now you would go to heaven and be accepted by God Almighty before his throne how do you know you say well it's all of grace yes it is all of grace we are not saved by works we are saved by grace we are saved by believing the promises of the gospel that is true but what you need to understand is grace is a powerful thing that he who has given you grace to repent and believe gives you grace to continue repenting and to continue believing he who gives you grace to believe unto justification also will give you grace for your sanctification 
that you might grow in holiness. As a matter of fact, listen to me. One of the greatest evidences that you have truly believed in Christ unto salvation is that God has begun a good work of sanctification in you. He works and works and works to make you holy. Now let me ask you, is that a reality in your life? But can you honestly tell me that your great desire is to be holy? Can you honestly tell me that your great desire is not to be like the world? To not be like what you see here in the West and many other places, but to be like Jesus Christ. Can you tell me that? Because if you cannot, you should be afraid. You should be very afraid. Those who love the world do not have the love of the Father. Now this is very, very important. God's motive for saving people is not found in that people. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When a holy God looks at sinful men, the only thing their sin motivates God to do is judge them, to condemn them. So if God is going to save men, it is not because of men. It is in spite of men. God does not save us because we deserve to be saved. God saves us because He is a Savior. God does not love us because we deserve to be loved. We do not deserve the love of God. We deserve His wrath. God saves us because He Himself is love. In America, in typical American contemporary evangelicalism what do we have I'll tell you what we have we have a great majority of the people in America claiming to be Christian and they live like devils but because they claim to be Christian and they identify themselves with Christ and yet live like devils God's name is not praised because of them God's name is blasphemed because of them but the question comes down, does everybody in America who says they're Christian, are they Christian? Absolutely not. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. And herein is the problem. When a church lowers the standard of the gospel in order to get more people to come in, when a church does not preach on holiness and what it means to be truly converted, then Christianity and the church fills up with a lot of ungodly people and because of their actions, the unbelieving world blasphemes the name of God. But what we need to understand is that the people who claim to know Christ and yet live in a way that contradict the Word of Christ and the character of Christ, they are not Christian. We are saved by faith alone. We are not saved by works. But what you need to understand is that a person who has been truly saved has been born again. They have become a new creature. God has done a tremendous work in them to demonstrate His power. He has made them into new creatures with new affections, new desires to serve Christ and to be holy. Has He done that to you? Let me ask you a question. Do you look at the world and long to be like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, have the world's respect and the world's esteem, if you're that way, you ought to be terrified. Because that just could be evidence that God has not done a work in you. If God's power cannot be seen in your life, leading you to greater and greater holiness, then maybe there is no power of God in your life that He has not regenerated your heart. You are not born again. You are not a Christian. Because He says, I am going to save people. Why? To demonstrate to the world how powerful I am, not only in saving their souls, but in transforming their lives. Is God transforming your life? Christians are not sinless. Christians are not perfect. 
Christians will struggle with sin and Christians can even fall. But in the midst of that weakness, it will be evident that God is working, God is teaching, God is disciplining, and God is bringing them to greater and greater heights of Christian maturity and holiness. Is that you? Since you professed faith in Christ, are your desires for Christ growing? Are your desires for holiness growing? Is God's power in transforming your life evident? Are you becoming less and less like the world and more and more like Christ? Or are you becoming more and more like the world? When God truly saves a person, what does He do? He begins to work in them. With what purpose? To pull them out of the world. To pull them out of worldliness. To pull them out of sin and to bring them to Himself. Now let me ask you a question. Is that obvious in your life? Do you see God working in your life to get more and more of the world out of you? And is God drawing you more and more to Himself and conformity to His image? Now let's talk for a moment about holiness. This is very important. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, without sanctification, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And what that means is this. If you have truly believed in Christ unto salvation, then God will be working in you to make you holy. If there is no evidence that God is working in you to make you holy, there is a good chance that you have not truly been converted. When God saves a person, He is cutting them off. From what? From the world. What is the world? Everything in, on this planet, every idea, every thought, every word, every action that contradicts God's will and God's nature. Everything on this earth that opposes God. When God truly saves a person, He cuts them off from that and He begins to separate them little by little, changing their life, getting the worldliness out of their life and drawing them unto Himself. Now, there's two aspects of holiness that's very, very important. One of them, holiness means to be separated from the world. Christian, one of the purposes of the Scriptures is to teach us what God hates so that we will run away from it. Make no mistake, there can be no friendship with God and the world. And between the believer, there can be no friendship between the believer and the world. If God is truly working in you, He is going to use His Word and the power of His Spirit to do what? To reveal to you what is wrong in this world and to draw you away from it. But holiness is not only ceasing to do what is evil. But holiness is primarily running to God, to be devoted to God, to grow each day, year after year, in a greater and greater devotion to God. Now, you can't have both things. You cannot. If you want God, you're going to have to let go of the world. And if you do not want to let go of the world because you love the world, then know this, the love of the Father is not in you. Young people, I know how deadly my culture is. I know what it's done to my own people. I've seen the West go into Eastern Europe and destroy churches. You are in a very deadly place. You live in a land full of all kinds of things that glitter, but they're not gold. You live in a land full of all kinds of promises that are lies. You live in a land that will do everything in its power to turn you away from Christ. 
but you live in a land that tells you you can have God and the world too. You live in a land that tells you you can love the world and love Christ and I want you to know it is a lie. It is a lie. Do not think I'm trying to be angry. Do not think I'm trying to have a mean spirit. I am saying this to save you from the monster that has killed more people than any political tyrant that has ever ruled this land, this planet. If you love the world, be afraid. Because that could just be an evidence God has never worked in you. You have never believed unto salvation. You have never truly been converted. Because if He truly saves you, He who began a good work in you will finish it. And why do we know that? This is a very important truth. Because His reputation is on the line. Remember, God saves people to demonstrate how powerful He is. And so if He begins a work in you, He will finish it to demonstrate His power. I want you to know that if God has brought you, brought you from the condemnation of sin, if He has truly saved you, if He has truly justified you, then the evidence of that is He will continue working in you to transform you. Why? Because every Christian is a demonstration of God's power. He is going to finish the work He has begun because His reputation depends upon it. That's why Paul warned in the book of Romans. He said that the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of the Jews who identified themselves with God and yet did not live according to God's commands. In the same way, can you say, can you prove that since the moment of your conversion, there is evidence that God is working in your life to make you holy. Can you see that? Can you tell me that you are truly a Christian because when you look at the world and it maybe deceives you and draws you to it, that God comes and disciplines you? That when you participate in sin, you can't stand it because the Holy Spirit is so convicting you. Or can you simply call yourself Christian and yet look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, do everything the world does? So if God saves a person, He's going to do these things in the life of that person. Is He doing these things in your life? And what are these things? First of all, He's going to work to make you holy. He's going to little by little remove from you your desire and your fellowship with the world. And He's going to replace that with a desire and a fellowship with Christ. Is He doing that? Since your supposed conversion, are you growing in your devotion to God and your love for Christ? Are you growing in holiness? Or are you the same person that you were when you began? Do you still love the world? Do you still want to be like the world? One of the things that the Lord will do when He has truly saved a person is again, He will begin to do a work of cleansing them. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, we are justified and we are right with God through faith. But if we have truly believed, God is going to begin to do a lifetime work of sanctification in us, of changing us, of cleansing us from all our filthiness and from all our idols. And I want you to know something. He can do it. He can do it. He is sovereign over the believer. And He can work in that believer's life to make that believer clean to cause that believer to grow in holiness. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And notice what He says, you will be clean. You will be clean. 
God will clean his people. And one of the greatest evidences that you have become a part of his people is that you cannot escape him. He will work in you to cleanse you. Now I want us to look, he says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. If I were to describe my Christian life, I would have to say this is one of the best verses to describe my life. I have been walking with the Lord for around 28 years. And in those 28 years, I have seen God's loving hand of discipline teaching me, putting me through trials, chastising me when I had gone the wrong way. I could see from almost the moment of my conversion that I had entered into a relationship with God that I could not escape. He had become my father and he is a very diligent father. He makes sure that his children do not run wild. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I was uh, your pastor. And I came home one night with my wife at, let's say, 12 at night. I was preaching somewhere very late. And I, as I was driving home, I went by a street corner and I saw your daughter that was 14 years old standing on that street corner with a whole bunch of very bad young people. As the pastor, and since my wife is in the car, I would pull up to the street corner and I'd say, girl, get in the car. I'm taking you home. But here's what you need to understand. I wouldn't be angry as a pastor with the little girl. But I would be angry with her father if he was a member of the church. I would go to him and I would say, what kind of derelict father are you? How could you so neglect your children that you would allow them to be out on the streets running wild without your care and your discipline? Do you honestly think that God is a derelict father? That God has all these children in America. He allows them to live in heresy. He allows them to follow every sort of lie. He allows them to live in sin and in every manner, every sort of way that contradicts his nature. Do you think God is that neglectful of his children? Absolutely not. One of the evidences, young people, that you truly belong to God that He truly is your Father, is that He is involved in your life to make you clean. In the same way, if you have truly been converted, God has a claim on you. You belong to Him. He is going to change you for His own glory, and He is going to change you because He loves you. He is not going to let you stay the way that you were. And He has the power to change you. He is a sovereign Father. If you can live in sin, live in the world with all your worldly friends doing all your worldly things and you can get away with it and there's no conviction of the Spirit, there's no discipline from God, it is evidence that you are an illegitimate child. You are not truly a child of God. If you love the sensuality of the world and you love all its boasting, its pride of the eyes, and its, its boasting in the flesh, and all the things that glitters in this world, and you can participate in it without the discipline of the Father, it is because the Father is not your Father. The goal of God in your life is not prosperity, it's not health, it's not wealth, and it's most certainly not your best life now. God's goal, if you belong to Him as a child, is to make you holy, to conform you to the image of Christ. He will cleanse you from your filthiness. He will cleanse you from your idols. And He will be very zealous in doing that. He will do anything that is necessary to make you conform to the image of His Son. Is He doing that in your life? Is He? So many people today, I've been born again, they say. And you ask them, what do you mean by that? Well, I made my decision. I prayed that prayer. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Yes, but has your heart changed? 
Has your life changed? Is it changing? Are you a new creature or someone who just repeated a creed and passed through a ritual? The evidence that you are truly converted is not that one time in your life you prayed a prayer and asked Jesus to come in. The evidence that you are converted is that one time in your life you repented of your sins and you continue repenting today. The evidence that you're saved is one time you believed unto salvation and you continue believing today. The evidence that you're converted is that one time God began a good work in you and He continues working in you today. Changing your life. Transforming you by His power. Look what He says here. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. In the supernatural work of salvation, this is what God does when a man is born again. He takes out his heart of stone, a heart that is dead, a heart that cannot hear God, cannot respond to God, and what it knows about God it hates. And by the power of the Holy Spirit hovering over that man, just like on the day of creation, God changes that man's heart from a heart of stone that is dead and cannot respond to a heart of flesh that is living and alive and can respond to divine stimuli. Now let me ask you a question. Has God done that to your heart? Has God done that to your heart? Can you remember a time in your life where you were just dead to God? You didn't care about God. You didn't care about His Word. You didn't care about sin. You didn't care about His voice, hearing Him, obeying Him, following Him, nothing. But then one day everything changed. God took out that heart of stone and He put in its place a heart that would respond to Him. My dear friend, when the Apostle Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, he's not just reciting beautiful poetry. He's teaching us something that is actually true. Have you become a new creature? Have you? Do you now respond to the voice of God? You may be sitting here right now, young person, all mesmerized by the world, looking like the world, loving the world, acting like the world, and you're sitting there going, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. Well, then you ought to be afraid. And you ought to seek God. And you ought to cry out to Him, Oh God, search my heart. Oh God, if I, if I do not know You, if all I have is religion but no salvation, Lord, I cry out to You, save me, change my heart, grant me grace, help me, Lord. Dear brothers, from Slavic lands, Listen to me. It'll only take one generation to lose everything. That's how difficult, how worldly the place is where you live. Pray. Pray for your children. Children, do not believe the lies not. They are deadly. If you are saved, he says, I will take out your heart of stone and I will put in its place a heart of flesh. Moreover, look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. My dear friend, think about this. Conversion is not just a human decision. What happens when you're converted? Not only does God transform your heart, what else does He do? He indwells you. He puts His Spirit within you. And look what it says. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. He says, when I change your heart and I put my spirit in you, you will live a different way. It will happen. It will. Young person, 
teenager, college student, even those of you who are older, but my burden here is for the young. Listen to me. Can you honestly look at me and say, He is my God. He is my God. I long to know His will. I long to obey His commands. I long to follow Him and be what He wants me to be. I am learning and He is teaching me to love what He loves and to hate what He hates. Can someone look at your life, young person, not while you're here at church, no, while you're there in the streets and no one sees you, can they look at your life and say, that person belongs to God. That person is different. That person is not like the world. That person is changing. Young person, do you desire to meet with God in the morning? Do you desire to meet with Him in the evening? Do you desire His Word? Do you want to be changed by it? Young person, when you fall into sin, does it break your heart and afflict you? Or do you love it? Do you relish it? Has God changed your heart? Does He continue changing your heart? Do you long to be free from the filth of this world? Do you long to be like Christ? If you can say yes, that is a great evidence that you have been born again. Thank you.